now we're recorded. Um, Okay, so <clears throat> let us start. Um, this is algebra. It has two numbers, depending on whether it's being taken by undergraduate or master students. And um, this is a real mathematics class. So that means we have to learn some algebra and be able to solve problems in algebra, of course, but also understand the concepts and be able to give proofs. So that's what we'll learn to do. And the text is this book by Alan Clark called Elements of Abstract Algebra. I chose it for two reasons. First, it's a good book. And second, it doesn't cost much money. So <clears throat> there are lots of algebra books that are excellent that cost $150, but this one's a Dover paperback and certainly costs less than $15 or $20, but it's quite good. And we're going to follow it. Um, so these lectures, I will give every Monday and Wednesday morning at nine o'clock. Um, they will be recorded and they will be posted on the YouTube channel that um, uh, is listed on Blackboard, um, which you need to have access to. So um, all sort of practical information about this course is on Blackboard. So you need to be able to access Blackboard. And it's also very important, you have to be able to read the emails I send you via Blackboard. And uh, usually the email address on Blackboard for you is your Lehman email account. So even if you <clears throat> tend to use Gmail or some other email service for ordinary emails, uh, for this course, certainly <clears throat> everything is sent out via Blackboard and you need to be able to check your Lehman uh, email account. Uh, there's homework due every week. Uh, you write out the homework and then you need to convert it to a PDF file and upload that to the assignment section of Blackboard. Uh, most people have printers and most printers these days allow you to scan a document and convert it to a PDF file. Uh, exams are done the same way. Um, you'll take the exam, uh, unless things change, uh, uh, and we actually give the exams physically on campus, but at the moment, the plan is the exams are also given um, over the internet. Uh, if the exam's at nine o'clock and nine o'clock, I post the exam and also email it to you. You have the usual one hour and 40 minutes to do the exam. Then you take your pages, scan them and upload the PDF file again to the assignment section on Blackboard. So you need to have the technical facility to do that. Uh, some students could never do it and uh, were able to use their cell phones to take screenshots of their uh, pages of their paper. And if you don't have a PDF capability, that's okay, but it's much better to be able to convert your exam paper and your homework papers to uh, PDF files. But all of the grading is done uh, all over the internet on Blackboard. So if you're not able to upload your homework and your exams, um, there's no way you can get a grade, right? That's, uh, but probably at this point, if you've been at Lehman or at CUNY, 
uh, for at least one semester, this is what you've been doing in most of your classes. Okay. And everything you need to know, practical information, syllabus, and so forth, it's all on Blackboard. Basically, today I'm going to talk about the introduction uh, to the book. And then uh, on um, Wednesday, we start with chapter one. And the basic core syllabus is to cover the first three chapters of the book. Um, uh, and we'll actually cover chapter one in just a couple of days. So most of the course is based on chapters two and three. And if there's time, a little bit of chapter four beyond that, but we'll see how that goes. Okay. So if you have a question, you are always free to um, unmute yourself and interrupt and ask a question. Uh, you can also put a question in chat, but I often miss the chat. So generally you should stay muted during the lectures, but do not hesitate to unmute yourself to ask a question at any time, okay? So before we start, uh, mathematics, are there any questions about uh, anything I've said or about how the class is administered? No? Okay. So this is algebra, which historically means solving equations. And I left a space here because there are all sorts of equations. For example, in calculus, you learned how to solve some differential equations. But the equations we want to solve in some sense are easier. We want to solve polynomial equations. And you can have polynomials in one or two or three or more variables. Um, and really we're just going to consider solving polynomial equations in one variable. So you might think this is pretty easy. Um, so in high school, you learn how to solve linear equations. y equals uh, ax plus b or quadratic equations y equals ax squared plus bx plus c or cubic equations well cubic equations you don't learn to do but i'll show you how to do that today that's an equation of the form y equals ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d. Or you could have fourth degree equations, which are called quartic. And solving the equation usually means finding an x for which y is equal to zero. So you want to solve ax plus b equals zero. That's the linear equation. Or ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. That's the quadratic. Or this is the cubic, or this is the quartic, and so forth. In general, the nth degree polynomial is y equals, let's say, a sub n x to the power n, a n minus one x to the n minus two, decreasing powers of x, a1, x plus a0, equals zero. So the question is, can we solve a polynomial equation? This is in some sense where algebra began. And the first two cases you learned how to do in high school. So, Suppose we have the linear equation, ax plus b equals zero. Of course, what makes this linear is that x really appears here. So the coefficient of x is not zero. And then you can solve it. 
AX is minus B. So X is minus B over A. <clears throat> so given a linear equation where A is necessarily non-zero, there's a unique solution. And I just wrote it down explicitly. Right? So if you have the equation seven X equals 13, the solution is X equals 13 over seven. Right? That's an example. Okay. Any questions about that? What about a quadratic equation? AX squared plus BX plus C equals zero. And again, quadratic means the X squared term really appears, so A is not zero. So you learned uh, a formula for solving this equation, but even if you don't remember it, it's not hard to figure it out. Because A is non-zero, I can divide by A just to have the leading coefficient of X squared equal to one. So if I divide by A, I get X squared plus B over AX plus C equals zero plus C over A equals zero. And then I can do what is called completing the square. This is X squared plus B over AX plus C over A equals zero. I like to add something to this to make this a perfect square. And what you add to this to make this a perfect square is you take half of this coefficient b over 2a and you square it and you get b squared over 4a squared. Because if I add b squared over 4a squared to the left side of the equation, I have to add it to the right side of the equation. So this really is inequality. So this says that x plus b over 2a all squared plus C over A is B squared over 4A squared. Okay. Any questions about this so far? And now we just proceed to try to solve this equation, bring this over to the other side. I get X plus B over 2A squared is b squared over 4a squared minus c over a. I just brought this to the other side. And when you subtract fractions, you have to put them over a common denominator. And a common denominator is 4a squared. So this is, I have to multiply this numerator and denominator by 4a, so minus 4a times c. Which means, if I take square roots, x plus b over 2a is plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4a squ 4ac over 4a squared. Of course, 4a squared is just the quantity 2a squared. So this is plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a squared. So I can take the 2a squared, the square root is just one over 2a. I can take that out from under the square root sign. b squared minus 4ac. So now I've solved For x, I get x, bring this to the other side, is minus b over 2a plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a, or over this common denominator of 2a minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac. 
So this is the famous quadratic formula, right? So the solutions, there are generally two of them, because you either have a plus sign or a minus sign. The solutions of ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero are x equal to minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Okay. So this is your basic quadratic formula from high school algebra. So let's look at some examples. Suppose we have the equation um, um, x squared Yeah, let's see a good example. X squared minus seven X plus 10 equals zero. So in this case, in the form AX squared plus BX plus C, A is the coefficient of X squared is one. Sorry, B Professor. Yeah, sure. Interrupt. Just see the bottom of the page. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, whenever I do that, just please interrupt and remind me. So A is equal to one, B is negative seven, and C is 10. So the solutions are X equals minus B minus minus seven, plus or minus the square root of b squared minus four times a, which is one, times c, which is 10, over two a, two times one. So this is minus minus seven is plus seven, plus or minus the square root of 49 minus 40, over two, which is seven plus or minus the square root of nine over two, which is seven square root of nine is three plus or minus three over two. So we get the two solutions, seven plus three over two, which is 10 over two or five, and seven minus three over two, which is four over two is two. So this quadratic equation has solutions five and two. And you can check if you put in x equal five, you get 25 plus 10 is 35, minus 35 is zero, or four plus 10 is 14, minus 14 is zero. So that's the solution of this quadratic equation. Any questions about that? Let's look at, oops, let's look at a couple more solutions, a couple more equations. Suppose we have the equation, I don't know, let's say, 3x squared minus 7x plus um, 6 equals 0. So in this case, Let me change this.
make this four, see what happens. So in this case, a is three, the coefficient of x squared, b is minus seven, and c is four. So x, which is minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus four a c over two a, is minus minus seven, which is plus seven, plus or minus the square root of b squared, 49, minus 4ac. So ac is 12. Four times 12 is 48, over two times three is six. So this is seven plus or minus the square root of one over six, which is just one. So I get the two solutions, seven plus one over six, which is eight over six, which is four thirds, or seven minus one over six, which is six over six, which is one. So these are the two solutions. If you're dubious about this, it's always good to check. Suppose we let x equal to 4 thirds. So 3x squared minus 7x plus 4 is 3 times 4 thirds squared minus 7 times 4 thirds plus 4. Let's see, 4 third squared is 16 over nine minus 28 over three plus four. Three times 16 over nine. This is 16 over three minus 28 over three plus four. 16 minus 28 is minus 12 over three plus four is minus four plus four, so it's zero. So it checks. All right, so this really is a solution of the quadratic equation. Right. Any questions about that? Right. Let's look at one more example of a quadratic. Suppose we have, um, I don't know, um, <coughs> x squared <coughs> plus 4x plus 2 equals 0. So in this case, the coefficients of a, b of x squared, x, and the constant term are respectively a equals 1, b equals Professor, four. it's Oops. cut out at the top. Thank you. A equals one, B equals four, C equals two. So we get X is equal to minus B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus four AC over two times one. Right? So this is minus four. Um, well, this is, I'll do it, but this is okay. It's not really what I was interested in. My, four squared minus eight, that's 16 minus eight. That's plus or minus the square root of eight over two. That's minus four plus or minus, of course, eight is four times two over two. So this is minus four plus or minus two root two over two which is minus two plus or minus root two. So we get minus two plus root two and minus two minus root two. These are the two solutions of this quadratic equation. Right. And again, we can check if we let, for example, x equal minus two plus root two, 
x squared plus 4x plus 2 is minus 2 plus the square root of 2 squared plus 4 times minus 2 plus root 2 plus 2. Let's see, what is this? If you square this, you get 4 minus 4 root 2 plus 2 plus, this is minus 8 plus 4 root 2 plus 2. And minus 4 root 2 and plus root 4 root 2 cancel. And here I have 4 plus 2 is 6. Minus 8 is minus 2 plus 2 equals 0. So this does check. Right. So in high school, this kind of calculation is what's sometimes called algebra, but it's really kind of baby algebra, but you do have to be able to do these kinds of what I will call absolutely routine calculations. This is prerequisite. Let's look at one last example. Let me just change this equation slightly. Let me make it x squared plus four x plus five. So now A is equal to one, B is equal to four, and C is equal to five. So X, which is minus B plus or minus square root, B squared minus four AC over two A, this is minus four, plus or minus the square root b squared, four squared is 16, minus four ac, ac is five, four times five is 20, over two. So this is minus four plus or minus, 16 minus 20 is minus four over two. And you can write minus four is four times minus one over two, so the square root of four is two. I get minus four plus two times the square root of minus one over two, which is minus two plus the square root of minus, oh, sorry, plus or minus, plus or minus. Minus two plus or minus the square root of minus one. And in high school, they would say, well, you can't take the square root of a negative number um, so there's no solution, but that really means there's no real solution. But before you've gotten to 300 level math classes, you should have learned about complex numbers. And we let I, another name for the square root of minus one is just the letter I. So we get these two solutions minus two plus i and minus two minus i. So this quadratic equation has two solutions, but they're not in the real numbers. They're complex numbers, okay? So I is just the complex number, which has the property that when you square it, you get minus one, right? There's nothing magical about that. It's just a number and whose square is minus one. And given this complex solution, let's just double check that it really is a solution. So let me do my check. So x squared plus 4x plus 5, let's say x is minus 2 plus i squared plus 4 times minus 2 plus i plus 5. Let's see, when you square this, well, you just square it by the way you always square a binary expression. Minus 2 squared is 4. 
you get two times minus two times i is minus four i plus i squared. And here you have minus eight plus four i plus five. And again, minus four i and plus four i, they cancel. I squared is minus one. So this is four minus one is three. Three minus eight is minus five plus five. We do get zero, it checks. Right? And just to make sure you know how to do arithmetic with complex numbers, you should plug minus two minus i into the equation and see that you also get a solution. All right. By the way, there's a very nice geometrical way to understand the difference between quadratic equations that have real solutions and quadratic equations whose solutions are complex numbers, right? So let's look at the last two examples we did. The last two examples were y equals x squared plus 4x plus 2. And we wanted to know when was that equal to 0. So let's look at the graph of the equation or the function y equals x squared plus 4x plus 2. This is the graph of a quadratic is always a parabola. And we saw that this quadratic equation had two roots. The roots were minus two plus root two and minus two minus root two. Right? Square root of two is about 1.4. So this is approximately minus 0 0.6, and this is approximately minus 3.4. And if we were to graph this equation, so if you graph y equals x squared plus 4x plus 2, of course, when x is 0, you get 2. That's the y-intercept. And it has roots, which are about minus 0.6, minus 3.4. You get a parabola that looks like this. And these two places where it crosses the x-axis, this is minus 2 minus root 2. And this is minus 2 plus root 2. So when you're trying to solve a quadratic equation, Geometrically, if you when you graph it in the real, the ordinary xy plane, if it crosses the x-axis, those are the places, those that give you the real numbers where the thing is zero, the function is zero. Right. So this was the example of a quadratic that had two real solutions. And this graph is a parabola that crosses the x-axis at two places. So as we looked at the second equation, y equals x squared plus 4x plus 5, what does the graph of this equation look like? Well, it's always a parabola. How do you get the vertex where it turns around? Well, that's the minimum. If we looked at dy dx, the derivative, that's 2x plus 4. That's equal to zero when x is equal to minus two. And the second derivative is two, which is positive, which means x equal minus two is a minimum, right? Everyone's taking calculus and this is the second derivative test. If you have a function, the derivative is zero wherever the function has a local maximum or minimum, 
And you can distinguish the two by the second derivative. If the second derivative is positive and the first derivative is zero, you have a local minimum. And at x equal to negative two, what is y? y is minus two squared plus four times minus two times five. That's plus four minus a plus five, that's one. So this parabola has a minimum at x equal minus two and y equal to one. That's the minimum. So the graph looks like that. So this parabola is above the x-axis. So the per this parabola does not intersect the x-axis. So there are no real solutions, but as we saw, there are two complex solutions. Okay. In the first homework, I'm going to give you some problems to do with complex numbers just to make sure that you get some practice using complex numbers because that's the nature of the world involves complex numbers not just real numbers Okay, any questions about this? All right, well, the nature of the human mind is to try to learn more and more and solve more and more problems or more and more equations. And since we just solve linear equations and quadratic equations, a natural thing is to next consider cubic equations, ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d. And you can look at a cubic curve, y equals ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d. So you should have studied these a lot in calculus and the graphs typically have a very beautiful form. So always a is different from zero, otherwise it's not cubic. If A is positive, the graph of Y equal X cubed, AX cubed plus BX squared plus CX plus D typically looks like this, right? This is a cubic curve. And in many cases, if this is the x-axis, the cubic curve crosses the x-axis at three points. So the equation ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d equals zero has at most three real solutions. That is real means real number of solutions. Of course, could have two solutions. You could have a curve that looks like this. So there's just two solutions. Or you could have a curve that has just one solution. Goes up, comes down and up again but it doesn't cross the x-axis here. This is just one real solution. And in calculus, you can show 
that if you take this curve, as x goes to infinity, y goes to infinity. And as x goes to minus infinity, y goes to minus infinity. So the graph has to cross the x-axis somewhere. So every cubic equation has at least one real solution. So it either has one, two, or three real solutions, but it might also have complex solutions. In any case, it's natural to ask, given this equation, how can we solve it? So the problem is just the way we solved the quadratic equation. Can we find a formula? That's the easiest thing to solve the cubic equation. <clears throat> so this was a problem that took 2,000 years to solve. Okay. That is, the Egyptians and the Babylonians knew how to solve linear equations and quadratic equations 2,000 years ago or more. But what about the cubic equation? That wasn't solved until sometime in the 17th century. Really, it took 2,000 years to solve this problem. Um, and, um, and the solution is a little bit complicated and it involves complex numbers. Um, so they don't teach it to you in high school, but uh, you shouldn't take a course in algebra without knowing or having seen at least how to solve a cubic equation. It's not obvious in any way. And certainly not obvious. That's why it took 2,000 years, right? So here's the cubic equation that we want to solve. And let's try to simplify the equation. So things are slightly easier if the coefficient of x cubed is one. So all you have to do is divide this by a and a is non-zero, so you can divide by it. So divide by a, you get x cubed plus b over ax squared plus c over ax plus d over a equals zero. So any solution of this equation is a solution of this equation and conversely, right? This, because all we've done is divide by a. So let's say that um, we've reduced the equation in this way and made it slightly simpler. We can actually make it even more simple by doing something which is analogous to completing the square. So let me just write this to make it easier. x cubed plus ax squared plus bx, or um, x cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d equals zero, right? Just so I don't have these. So capital B is b over a and so forth. So let's make a substitution. So let's substitute. So I'm really going to change variables. Suppose I let x be equal to y minus b over 3. Right? So in this equation, I'm going to put in x equals y minus b over 3. So what I get is y minus b over 3 cubed plus b times 
y minus b over three squared plus c times y minus b over three plus d equals zero. So this is now an equation in y. And again, if I can find the solution of this equation y, then if I let x equal y minus b over three, I have a solution of this equation, right? So I can substitute in here, x equals y minus b over three to get this. And here I can substitute x equals y plus b over three, I would get back that, right? So we have to expand this and just collect the terms. So we get a polynomial in y. So, You know how to expand a quadratic, but you should also know how to expand a cubic, right? So let me just write this down on a scrap of paper just to remind you. If you have um, u minus v cubed, this is u cubed minus three u squared v plus three uv squared minus v cubed, right? That's just how you expand the cubic. So here I have this cubic where my u is y and my v is b over three. So this is y cubed minus three y squared times b over three plus three y b over three squared minus b over three cubed. That's this first term. And then I have my second term, b times this squared. Well, we know how to square stuff. That's y squared minus two b over three y plus b over three squared. plus the last two terms, c times y minus b over three plus d equals zero. Let's see, what is that? So this is, I have y cubed, here the threes cancel, minus b y squared, plus this, I don't really care too much what it is. This is b squared over nine times three. It's b squared over three times y minus b cubed over 27. Let's see, what is this term? This term is plus by squared minus two b squared over three y plus b cubed over nine plus cy minus bc over three plus d equals zero, right? Okay. And the important thing to notice is I have a minus by squared and a plus by squared and they cancel. So what I get is when I make this substitution, my equation in y is y cubed. I have no y squared term. I have a y term and a constant term. So just to use exactly the same notation that you will find in the introduction, let's just call the coefficient of y little q and the, and the constant term minus r equals zero. So so the basic first simplification, let's go back to see where we started. We started with the cubic equation. Our first simplification was to make it monic. That means the coefficient of x cubed is one, which we do just by dividing by a. And then, so this is a cubic which has leading coefficient one. And it would be even simpler if the x squared term didn't appear, if there were no quadratic term. And 
I'm lucky enough or clever enough or someone was smart enough long ago to say, if we make this substitution, x equals y minus b over three, you get an equation in y with no quadratic term. When you do all the work expanding out and you get something that looks like y cubed minus qy equals r. So this is sort of the reduced simplified cubic. And if I can find the solution y of this equation, then x equal to y minus that b over three, right? This, this was my substitution. If I can find y, then x, I can find x. X is y minus capital B over three, where capital B is little b over a. So what we just proved <clears throat> as the first step in solving the cubic is that we only have to look at cubics of this reduced, somewhat simplified form. So let me copy that down here. We want to solve an a cubic of the form y cubed plus qy minus r equals zero. So, after 2,000 years of work, someone was, again, clever enough or lucky enough to say, let's make a kind of another substitution, something of a strange substitution. Let me just, just since we're used to using x as our main variable, let me just change the variable to x, but it's the same problem. So we want to solve a cubic x cubed plus qx minus r equals zero. This just means a cubic that's monic and has no quadratic term. So let's make the following sort of strange substitution. Let's let x equal u plus v. So there's no reason why this should make any sense because you're changing an equation in one variable x to an equation in two variables u and v, which should be much more complicated. Okay. Let's see what happens when we do that. We get u plus v cubed plus q times u plus v minus r equals zero. And again, if we expand this, because it's just expanding a cubic, this is u cubed plus three u squared v plus three v u squared plus v cubed plus Q times U plus V minus R equals zero. And let me just rearrange this slightly. This is U cubed plus V cubed plus these terms, three U squared V plus three V U squared plus Q times U plus V minus R equals zero. I just rearranged this, I put this over here. That's u cubed plus v cubed. From this expression, I can factor out a three uv. I get three uv times, sorry, this is uv squared. When I factor out a three uv, I get u plus v plus q times u plus v minus r equals zero. And if I factor u plus v out of this, I get u cubed plus v cubed plus three uv plus q times u plus v minus r equals zero. Now, <clears throat> what will be typical in this class and most math classes, both calculus certainly is, it's always hard to follow what's going on in the lecture as the lecture is being given. That's why um, 
there is the notion of uh, studying. You have to look at your notes or look at the video and be able to go through this step by step and justify each step. Right? Now, we have some freedom and we made this substitution, x equals u plus v. Suppose I wanna simplify this equation by having this term just drop out, this term disappear. So we want to choose V so that three UV plus Q is equal to zero, which means that three UV is minus Q, which means V is minus Q over three U. So suppose we choose V to be minus Q over three U. So then what do we get? We get U cubed plus V cubed. This term is zero, right? That's how we chose V so that three U V plus Q is zero minus R equals zero. Let's see, this is u cubed minus q cubed over 27 u cubed minus r equals zero. If we clear the denominator, well, maybe not clear it completely. Let's multiply by u cubed. You get u to the sixth minus q cubed over 27 minus r u cubed is zero. And another way of saying that is just rearranging it. <coughs> u to the sixth minus r u cubed minus q cubed over 27 is zero. So I can solve the cubic equation if I can solve this equation. And you might say, well, that's ridiculous because this equation is more complicated. This has degree six. If I wanna solve this equation for you, how in the world can I do that? Because this is an equation of degree six. But then the whole point is u to the sixth is u cubed squared. So this equation can be written as u cubed squared minus r u cubed minus q cubed over 27, oops, uh, yeah, equals zero. And this is a quadratic equation in u cubed, right? If you think of u cubed as a variable, this is a quadratic equation in u cubed. And I can use the quadratic formula to solve this. u cubed is going to be equal to minus b, that's r, plus or minus the square root of b squared minus four ac, a is one, c is q cubed over 27 minus. So plus four q cubed over 27 over two. So that's r over two plus or minus one half the square root of r squared plus four q cubed over 27. If I multiply and divide by four, then I could factor out square root of four is two. I get this is r over two plus or minus the square root of r squared over four plus q cubed over 27.
which means u <coughs> is the cube root of r over two plus or minus the square root of r squared over four plus q cubed over 27. So that gives me a value for u and v was minus q over three, three u and x was u plus v. So I found an x that solves the cubic equation I started with. Now, you might say that's really pretty complicated and <clears throat> it's true, it is complicated, which perhaps explains why. Um... Sorry, Professor, well, do you mind sliding up the paper a touch? Thank you. Explains maybe why it took 2000 years for people to solve this problem, but that's the solution. Now, let me say something about a cube root, All right? Um, a cube root of a number uh, A is a solution of the equation x cubed equals a, right? <clears throat> so a cube root of a <clears throat> is a number x such that when you cube x, you get a. That is, you wanna solve this equation for a. So let's look at a simple case. Suppose a is equal to one. We want to solve x cubed equals one. Of course, one cubed is one. So one solution of the equation is x equal one. But it's not the only solution. Suppose we let x equal to minus a half plus the th square, square root of three over two times i. This is a complex number. What is x cubed? It's minus a half plus root three over two i cubed. If we expand this by the usual formula for expanding the cube of a binary expression, you get minus a half cubed plus three times minus a half squared times root three over two i plus three times minus a half times root three over two i squared plus root three over two i cubed. Let's see, what is that? Minus a half cubed is minus an eighth. Minus a half squared is a fourth times three. So this is three fourths times root three over two i. Minus, three times minus a half is minus three halves. Root three over two i, when you square it, 
squaring root three is three, squaring two is four. So you get three, four, and what's I squared? Minus one. And finally, this last term is root three cubed, that's three root three over two cubed, which is eight times I cubed. By the way, what's I cubed? I cubed is I squared times I. I squared is minus one. So I cubed is minus I. So let's see what I have here. I have minus an eighth. This is three root three over eight I. Minus times minus is plus. So this is plus nine eighths. I cubed is minus I, so I get minus three root three over eight I. These two terms cancel and nine eighths minus one eighth is one. So if I take this number and cube it, I get one. And in exactly the same way, and you should work this out yourself just to check. If X is minus a half minus root three over two I, then X cubed, which is minus a half minus root three over two I cubed is also equal to one. So therefore, one has three cube roots. One, let me call it, let's say omega, which is minus a half plus root three over two i. I don't write omega with a bar over from minus a half minus root three over two i. <coughs> so these are three cube roots of one. And you know that you write the real numbers on the real line, but you can write complex numbers in the complex plane. is the xy plane, the usual xy plane. If you take the complex number z equal x plus yi, you just assign it to the point in the plane with coordinates xy. So every complex number can be represented as a point in the xy plane, that's the complex number z. If we take the unit circle, circle of radius one, this point is I and this point is minus I. And this number omega minus a half plus root three over two I, that's exactly this point. And omega with the bar over it, is exactly this point. These are two points on the unit circle. And of course, so these are the three roots of unity, roots the cube roots of one, here, here, and here. In fact, if you were to connect them with straight lines, this would be an equilateral triangle. So if you take the triangle, the equilateral triangle, inscribed in the unit circle with one vertex at one, the two other vertices would be the other cube roots of unity. So this is a very pretty geometrical way to see the cube roots of one. Okay. Okay, so what I've just discussed are, um, 
it's really just the first page or two of the introduction. Um, but before studying officially algebra, sometimes called modern algebra, not because it's modern, because it's at least 150 years old, sometimes called abstract algebra because it's slightly more abstract than what I did today was very concrete. Uh, um, but it, it's important to understand the origin of algebra is this simple problem of trying to solve polynomial equations, find, trying to find the roots of a polynomial. So in Babylonian times, people could, at least the educated people at the time, could solve linear and quadratic equations. 2000 years later in the Renaissance, it was discovered how to solve a cubic equation and also how to solve a, an equation of degree four. Um, so the next problem was to solve an equation of degree five and that took another 200 years. And at the end of the 200 years, sometime in the 19th century, it was learned you can't solve a fifth degree equation. It's impossible. It's not a question of not being smart enough. It's impossible uh, in a very precise mathematical sense. And if you take a second semester of algebra, uh, they say we cover chapters one, two, and three. If you cover chapters four and five of this book in the second semester of algebra, then you see um, how to deal with the problem of solving a fifth degree or quintic equation. Okay. Any questions about anything that we were talking about today? Um, uh, this is probably new to most of you, uh, certainly solving a cubic. Um, and it's important to be able to do these calculations and it's important to deal with complex numbers. So um, I will post this video on YouTube in the next 10 or 15 minutes, and it's there forever. Because um, I know how to post videos, I don't know how to delete them. Um, and we will resume on Tuesday. Okay. Any questions about this or anything about the course? Okay. Yes. Uh, Stay well, stay warm. Yeah, is there a question? Yeah, if I don't receive my book yet, are you gonna post like a few pages of the book for now? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I will with the try... winter weather, I think it got delayed. Yeah, no, no, okay. Um, yeah, I will post a few pages uh, on Blackboard. And if you don't see them by tonight, uh, please just send me an email, right? That's, <coughs> I check my email very, very often. Um, and it's easy for me to remember, to, it's easier for me to remember my, to check my email than to remember what I promised to do. So if I haven't posted a, a PDF of uh, at least the introduction um, by tonight, send me an email and I'll do it right away. Okay. Okay, thank you. Sure, anything else? Okay, all. Um, uh, I'll also be having sort of online Zoom office hours several times a week, which are completely uh, voluntary. But if you have any questions, you are more than encouraged to log in on one of the office hours and ask me questions and or ask me to solve problems. I'm happy to do it. All right, all. Uh, we'll be back on Wednesday morning at nine o'clock. Thank you, Professor. Okay, bye. Have a nice day, Professor. Thank you.